Stars, the copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Seattle police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 293 regarding a suspicious man. Be on the lookout by Edmund Romine, alias Jim of the Fleet. This man is suspected of forging payroll checks. That's all. Rolls and quits. A gallon of gasoline may look like any other and occupy the same amount of space in your gas tank, but the real test of a motor fuel is what it will do. How will it make your motor perform? Some gasolines are better than others. They're just made better, that's all. And there is one gasoline that plays second fiddle to none of them. I'm referring, of course, to the new all-purpose Rio Grande crack. This radically new motor fuel is made better. We put more vital ingredients into all-purpose Rio Grande crack. Twice as many, in fact, as the three elements found in most ordinary gasoline. And more than that, friends, this double portion of power-producing ingredients are so perfectly blended with hairline precision that this revolutionary fuel multiplies the performance of every automobile it powers in many ways. These include not only the top speed and power of which your car is capable, but unprecedented smoothness and real money-saving mileage. Police cars, ambulances, fire engines, and other emergency equipment were the first proving ground for this great new motor fuel. When it answered every demand, met every purpose beyond their fondest expectations, we gave it to you. Drive into your neighborhood red and white Rio Grande station and take aboard a tank full of the new all-purpose crack, the most highly recommended public-serving gasoline sold in the West. The story we are to hear tonight has been taken in the main from confidential files of the office of Chief of Police, William N. Sears of Seattle, Washington. We have therefore asked Chief Sears to open our program. It is a pleasure to be the guest of a program that, in my opinion, is doing so much toward educating the average citizen regarding the work done by law enforcement agencies in protecting him against lawless elements. I shall never cease to wonder at the stupidity of the criminal in imagining that he can get away with crime. It is true that crime costs a staggering amount in the United States every year. But the fact remains that eventually the criminal loses. His crime is never profitable to anyone. And his continued struggle against the law inevitably results in his learning the fact that crime of any sort cannot pay. How this lesson was brought home to the criminals in tonight's story, we shall see as the program progresses. <laughs> Prison printing shop at Salem, Oregon, two convicts stand side by side operating the presses. It is early in the year of 1935. Well, I'm glad that batch is done. Why? Why not? <laughs> You'll only have another batch to print tomorrow. So what? I'll be glad when that's done, too. Being glad about things in this place will <laughs> only make you bitter, my boy. Ah, you old stir bums, give me a pain. <laughs> oh, Forty ain't old. Yeah, bet you spent most of them years in stir, I can tell. Only because you've been told. And I haven't let them get me. And this one's not getting me. It will if you don't change your way. Will you listen to what's talking? You're a sweet one to put on a reform act. Oh, don't get me wrong, my boy. I merely meant that you must change your mental attitude while paying your debt to society. Yeah, what good will it do me? Well, it'll help you when you get out. You'll be in the proper frame of mind to take your living where you don't find it. <laughs> I notice you always bounce right back. <laughs> Quite true. <laughs> yeah, but not without profit. Profit? You mean you got a role? Not exactly. My profit has been an experience. Each time I make some blunder and blame no one but myself. So what did it get you besides a stretch? The knowledge that I shall perfect my technique. And it's worth all my years of striped contemplation. <laughs> you know, sometimes I think you're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> but this place don't get you down, so maybe you got some. Of course I have. Perseverance is what counts <laughs> in any line. I'll never forget the time I was convicted in Vancouver. <laughs> it was in 1916, and I think it was for forgery. Oh, yes, of course it was. 
because I was interviewed personally by the American Bankers Association. I said to them, gentlemen, I said, I have always been a crook, and I always expect to be a crook. You did? <laughs> yeah, I did. I don't mind telling you, they blew their tops. <laughs> Boy, that was good. <laughs> yeah. And then there was the time in London when I got a year for burglary, dear old London. I was with the Canadian Army, so I got nine years off for patriotism. <laughs> yeah, if the war hadn't been over, I'd have had a suspended sentence in the trenches. <laughs> hey, you've really been all over, haven't you? Yeah, that's how I got my nickname, Jimmy the Flea. Jimmy the Flea? Yeah, that's it. Not at all in keeping with my dignity, but quite descriptive. I was in Detective Tennant's office in Seattle one time, and Charlie said something about that. Well, of course, it's... No use to tell you, Jimmy, that you've got a very bad record. Yeah, no, Chief. Hurts you to tell me about it more than it hurts me. All right, go ahead and laugh at me. <laughs> you haven't learned anything since the time you were ten years old. Oh, don't tell me. I was sent to the state training school for <laughs> in Chehalis, Washington. For burglary. Yeah, nasty thing, burglary. You're a likable fellow, Jimmy. Yeah. And I don't want to get tough with The you. same to you, Chief. <laughs> and you haven't got anything on me. Well, no, because you do something, and when we go to put the finger on you, you've hopped. And there's someplace else. <laughs> You're just like a flea. Oh, that's a harsh name, Chief. <laughs> yes, Jimmy the Flea. Yeah. But someday we're going to put the finger on you, and when we do, you're going to be smashed. Just like a flea. I don't suppose you'll listen. So that name stuck to me ever since. Well, it looks like you ain't been so spry with your jumping lately. Yeah, they haven't kept their finger on me long, and they'll never put it on when I get out this time. Yeah. I perfected my technique. Hey, what do you suppose I asked to be put in this printing shop for? You tell me. Very simple. I made blunders and forgery in the past, but when I get out of here this time, I'll know all about printing, ink, and grades of paper. Hey, it's pretty smart at that. Yes, sir. I've learned all the angles, and they'll never get me this time. When do you get out, Jimmy? On March the 2nd, 1935, Jimmy the Flea will start hopping again. <laughs> In October 1937, Frank Borneman, head of the police check detail in Seattle, entered a tavern on 2nd Avenue. With him were detectives Herman Foy and Seth Taylor. What will that be, Sam? Uh, we're from headquarters, check detail. Are you the man that had some paper hung on him Saturday? Oh, so you guys finally decided to come around. Now listen, eh? mister, we had a couple dozen other places to check up on. And I'd advise you to be more cooperative than the rest of them. Can you give us any information or can't you? Yeah. This guy comes in Saturday and gives me a rubber check. So the management wants some pinch. Well, the police department understands how the management feels. And we'd like to do something about it. All we want is a little description of the guy. If it's not asking too much. I told you all I can. He buys a beer and gives me a bum check. So management don't like it. Well, I can understand then. That was Saturday. The check didn't bounce until Tuesday. I've had hundreds of guys in here since then. Yeah, but they all didn't cash checks. So, you know, he looked like a businessman. You mean he told you he was a businessman? Come to think of it, he, he had a briefcase. What? A briefcase? Yeah. Oh, then he must be a businessman. Yeah. I, I remember because on account he laid it on the counter and got beer on it. Not beer. It's too bad somebody didn't throw beer in his face. And you might remember what he looked like. Several days later, Inspector Borneman assembled all the known facts concerning the phantom forger. Still working with him were Detectives Boy and Taylor. I hope you boys know what we're up against. I think so. Yeah. After hanging $400 worth of paper in the city over the weekend, we know that he wears good clothes, has gray hair, and wears glasses. And last but not least, he has a briefcase. These mm. checks are a work of art. The printing's perfectly balanced. And it's on regulation check paper. Yeah, even the bank serial number's on it, in the right place. You know, only a printer with expert training could do that kind of work. Sure, even the banks don't know they're phony until they're sent back to the firms they're drawn on. Well, we've contacted every printing shop and paper plant in the city. No lead there. I didn't expect any. Apparently, this fellow comes into a city in the middle of the week and gets familiar with it. On Saturday, he sends the phony paper floating around, and it doesn't get to the bank until Monday at least. And then it's Tuesday, Wednesday, or even Thursday before he gets back to the firm and is checked on the books. And by that time, the guy's hundreds of miles away. Exactly. 
I got in touch with other cities, and a guy that works like him has wandered from Dallas, Texas, to Ottawa, Canada. Oh, and Tacoma, he had checks printed on the Better Business Bureau. Oh, the guy's crazy. Yeah, like a fox. Who was going to suspect him in Olympia when he had checks printed on the American Red Cross or in Kelso on the Chamber of Commerce? Well, love now, look, me. I'm going to ask every city that he's been in to send us the dates that he visited them. I get you. We can trace the route he takes and get an idea when he's able to show up here again. That's the idea. In the meantime, you two keep circulating among the merchants. When I get all the reports, we'll get together. Uh -huh. Maybe in that way, we'll be able to figure where he's going to jump next. Well, boys, I heard from most of the towns, and from what I gather, the Phantom's been driving them crazy for nearly two years. Hmm. And they don't know any more about him than we do. You know, I just happened to think. Yeah? I can't remember any report from Portland. Well, that's funny. it will be a natural stopping place on the way up the coast to Seattle from San Francisco. And he's hung paper in both those cities. You think he's afraid of being recognized if he hangs it in Portland? That's an idea. Hmm. Well, maybe he lives there. And has his printing plant there, too. Something tells me it's the first real angle we've had. It sounds good. But I figured out one that might help if uh, we can find out where he lives. Well, let's fill it. Look at these two checks he signed. Mm, one C.E. Rivers and the other R.A. Emery. You see that hook he puts on the capital R both times? Yeah. Don't you think that that hook is a trick that a guy would use only if his real name has a capital R in it? Hey, I think you've got something there. You sure have. Boys, we've really got something to work on. We'll get a line on Portland, and I'll bet we'll catch a phantom forger with his own hook. On the night of June 3rd, Inspector Blodgett of the Bellingham Police Department was answering a call from the model cafe and tavern. Are you the plimsman what is for to come from the station house? Yeah, did you put in the call? Sure, I'm for to put in the call. I am telephoning that you should come quick. My name is George Baracolis. How do you do? Uh, are the men still in the cafe? No, I am very sorry. But they are running out when I am refusing to give them the money for check. Well, I told you to stall them out until I got here. Hurry, Mark. I am for thinking, you say. Boil them out until oh, they are getting here. For the love of Mike, never mind. What they look like? Did you know them? No, they are looking like... I have never seen them before. before. Asthma? Asthma chronic. Uh, well, just tell me in your own way what happened. I can see you will, asthma and all. Yeah, they are cashing one check this morning on the tavern side. Tonight they are cashing one... On the cafe side. So I am saying to myself, there are snakes in the wood pile. I can see your point. Uh, do you think you could describe them in? All with plenty from pleasure. Number one is 40 or 45 years old, or somewhat between that. Mm -hmm. He is having gray hair and dark clothes. He's standing up to me at the same top for our heads. Mm, about five feet nine inches tall. Huh? Number two is more than... Somewhat young. And he's maybe 20. Uh -huh. He's being uh, six feet over two inches high and has gray clothes all over. His hair is dark, curl up, because he's having no hat. Uh -huh. All right, Mr. Uh, Baracolas, I'll translate your descriptions and have them broadcast. Uh, would you let me have the check they gave you this morning? Sure, sure. And I hope if you are not for to be catching them by your broadcast. You will frame this check for me so I can be hanging it up where I can't afford to see it. Hello, Heiko. Hello, Inspector. There are two men answering your description of that Chinese restaurant. Oh, nice work. I was cruising around and got the call on the radio. Let's go in. Of course, I couldn't be sure. Hey, but there they are in that booth. Uh, let's go visit them. Not bad looking. I uh, hope you gentlemen won't mind this intrusion. Hey, what's the idea? Oh, oh, oh that's quite all right. Uh, sit down, officers. Oh. Uh, I, I guess you're an officer, too. Yes, uh, Inspector Blodgett. Oh, yeah. What made the young fellow resent us? Oh, he's just a little out of sorts. <laughs> Not out of uh, funds, though, is he? What do you mean by that? I was just wondering. Uh, do you mind telling me where you were about half an hour ago? No, no, oh, I don't mind, but I can't tell you exactly. Why not, mister? Well, simply because we were just walking around. Mm. 
You didn't happen to be walking around the vicinity of the Mont Cafe and Tavern, did you? Why, not that I know of. I, I never even heard of it. Did you, Walter? Nope. You uh, live here? No, no, no. From the east. Mm. Just driving through town. Well, how come you were walking around for the last half hour? Well, that's your new cop suddenly ain't a right to question us like this. No, but we do have the right to arrest you on suspicion if you don't answer it. Suspicion of what? Forgery. <laughs> well, that's ridiculous. Well, go ahead and ask your questions. Well, I'll ask the young fellow some. Who else is in town with you? My sister. Orville? Please don't lie to the officers. Why should you say you were here with your sister? Because I am. These cops haven't got anything on us, and I'm getting tired of their questions. And I'm getting tired of their stalling around, so let's all have a nice, refreshing ride to headquarters. Held for questioning, the suspects described the girl, but refused to reveal their identity. On the following day, a girl answering the description of Orville's sister was apprehended and brought to Inspector Blodgett's office for questioning. I'm going to be very frank with you, young lady, because I'm sure you know what you're here for. Oh, but I don't. Honestly, I don't. All right, here it is. The older of the two men you were traveling with answers the description of a man who's been forging checks all over this part of the country. Oh, well, how can you say such a thing? Very easily. Because their refusal to tell us who they are makes it pretty certain. Oh, you are persecuting them. You're cruel. Uh, now, crying isn't going to do a better good. Uh, well, I, I'll have to tell you the truth, but... Oh, I'm so ashamed. Well, that's no new combination to me, so go right ahead. Well, well, they're just trying to protect me. You see, I... I ran away with them. I, I ran away from my husband, and, uh. and they're just trying to protect my good name. What? Yes. Now you know the truth. Oh, so that's the truth, huh? Don't you think it's wonderful of them? Yeah, yeah, I think it's wonderful. But now to them... I think it's the best spur-of-the-moment alibi I ever heard. What do you mean? Just this. I've got a hunch that you three hung paper all over this town on Saturday. And you're very anxious to make a trip before it starts bouncing tomorrow. Ah, uh, you beast. Uh, maybe I am. Anyhow, we've got a lot of cages around here, and we'll keep you in one of them just to see if my animal instinct is right about those checks. You can't keep us here. We will. But it may go a lot easier for you if you tell us the real truth. Well, all right. Here it is. Mm. That hot-headed nitwit is my brother, and... I'm married to the old fool. Well, well, go on. Uh, we've got our own printing press in Seattle, and we wrote checks around dumps like this town. <laughs> and, mister, we really plastered this place. Hmm. Tell me more. Well, you'll find out anyhow. I'd go into a grocery store outside the business district and start in. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you mind telling me uh, what system the men used when they papered the town? Well, sometimes Orville would dress up like a truck driver and tell him it was his paycheck. My husband would use the businessman angle. Uh, uh. Roger speaking. Oh, yeah, yeah. Send them right in. And uh, bring in those two we picked up last night on the paper hanging deal. Well, we're going to have a little gab fest, young lady. Some of the boys from Seattle are very interested in you. Yes, yeah, that's sweet of them. Uh, come in. Hello, Roger. Hello. They asked us to escort these two gentlemen in here. Oh, yeah. They're the ones you came to see, Borneman. I'm glad you let me know you got them. Oh, this is uh, Seth Taylor and Herman Ford. Hi, boys. How do you know? They've been yeah. working with me, so I brought them along to look over the Phantom. You haven't got a thing on us. My lawyer's going to sue this hit police department for plenty. Pipe down. Your sister spilled the whole thing. What? Hey, it's not so. I didn't have anything to do with it. They got me into it. They forced me to come with them. They made me do it. You yeah. sniveling idiot. Now, both of you, shut up. It seems in character for the one we're interested in to keep his dignity. Uh, what's your name, mister? Uh, me? Uh, Ross Romine. Romine, huh? Will you uh, write your name on this piece of paper? Certainly. Okay. Is there anything else you want to tell us? No, no. Well, you'll find our place in Seattle anyhow, so Ruth might as well tell you where it is. I just don't feel like talking. I'm tired. Well, I think that'll be all for the present. Uh, Benson. Put these three away. Well, what do you think? He answers the description and works the same way. Well, I don't know. Got any of his paper? One. Here it is, and there'll be more tomorrow. Mm-hmm. What do you think of it, boys? Uh, it's the same type of printed stuff. All the details are there. But it's not quite good enough, is it? And you know that uh, hook on the R that he used? This guy didn't use it when he wrote Romaine just now. I don't think he was faking, either. No, this paper looks like an imitation of the Phantom's work, sort of a forgery of a forgery. Oh, for crying out loud. Where does that get us? I know where it's going to get us. 
Right back to Seattle, where we can give this guy's hideout a going over. Yeah, there's something fishy about this setup. It sure is. It doesn't just happen that these two guys work in exactly the same way. And you're positive that Romine isn't the one that the whole country's looking for? Sorry, Blodgett, but that's the way I feel about it. Well, I guess you know the spot you'll be in if uh, we prove he is. I'll have to take a chance on that. Come on, boys. Looks like our work's just begun. <laughs> Returning to Seattle, the officers went immediately to the hideout of Ross Romine. While making a thorough search of the premises, Detective Foy makes a discovery. Sure didn't leave much lying around. Here's a drawer full of circulars and stuff, mostly junk. Now look at everything. This is our last bet for the time being. Hey, here's a couple of old letters. Well, I wouldn't hesitate about reading them. Uh, this one's addressed to Ross Romine in San Francisco. Uh, wait a minute. What do you got, Herman? The return address is to E.A. Romine in Portland, Oregon. I wonder what that means. You know, we figured he lived in Oregon because he didn't hang any paper there. But what's this stuff about E.A. Romine? Well, maybe if you'd read the thing, you might find out. It's, uh, let's see, it's signed Edmund Romine, but the whole thing's typewritten, even the signature. It's a cinch Edmund is Ross's brother. Uh, and he lives in Portland. Well, what do you think of that? Well, it doesn't prove anything. You mean it doesn't prove what you hope it will? Go ahead and read the letter. My dear Ross. Boy, if it was only written in longhand hey, so we could see if Brother Edmund hooks his eye. Keep still, Seth. Uh, dear, I'm starting over again. Yeah, we know that. Go on. It occurs to me that I owe you a letter. And so I... Yeah, I know. I... Nothing. Uh, hey, get this. You may be interested to know that I am about ready to take a cruise through your territory. So in the habit of taking cruises. I have the preliminary work done, and I am waiting for my health and weather conditions to improve. Now, well, what could he mean by the preliminary work? Sounds to me like printing checks. Go on, go on. My itinerary will include Klamath Falls, Stockton, Oakland, Watsonville, and San Jose. We only had that map of the lines on it here. Hey, now, wait a minute. Get this. I do not expect any staggering returns in the way of net earnings on the trip. What else do you say? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing. That's right. It's just signed Edmund in type. Well, I'll be darned. Well, that was a big build-up to nothing. Sure was. It just seems, though, that I saw another letter in here. Hey, hey, give me that drawing. Come on, now, get out of the way. Hey, we're acting like a bunch of kids in this case. Well, we haven't had a case like this for a long time, Frank. Yeah, I know, and it's going to be a lot of fun to get this guy. Mm -hmm. All right, go ahead, read the letter. Well, it's addressed to J. Ross Romine, San Bruno, California, and it's written in longhand. Hey, let me see it, let me see it. it. Gentlemen, wait a minute. Now, let me read it. It says, Dear Ross. Let me see that writing. Okay, here's the envelope. Look at the R on Romine. Hmm. You see what I see? I see a hook that would snag a shark. All right, Mr. Taylor, go ahead with your reading. It says, Dear Ross. Yeah. I'm starting again, too. You win. Go ahead. All right. My health isn't so good. Uh, oh, get I to the think. point. Hey, here's the situation. I can't risk working in lead type as long as I'm in this condition. And just when I am able to do any more work of this nature is a problem that I can't answer. So he knows all about the printing business. It's getting better and better. Ah, now here's something. Listen. You've got to hold on until I can come down there, Ross. I'd be afraid to turn you loose on your own. There are angles to this business. Curves that have taken me a long time with many vicissitudes to learn. Vicissitudes with bars, I'll bet. You haven't heard anything yet. No, we're listening. Uh, You suggest San Francisco. It is one of the toughest towns to work over due to the fact that all the leading banks maintain night auditing forces. Now I ask you, what more do we want? Just one thing, and here it is, if you guys will shut up and let me read it. Go Go on, nothing will surprise me now. Above all, Ross, don't get panicky and do anything foolish. Try to hold on until I see you. Give my best wishes to Ruth. And then it's signed Edmund. Say, Ruth was the dame they nabbed in Bellingham. Sure, the one that stooled on them. Then it's as plain as the nose on your face. The guy they've got in Bellingham is the brother of a phantom. Sure, he tried to learn the racket and went off half cock. Now, where's that return address of Edmund Romine? Now, wait a minute. Oh, here it is. Uh, 5933 Southeast Hawthorne Boulevard, Portland, Oregon. Now, Seth, you get over to the prosecutor's office and get a warrant. Yeah. Telegraph it to Portland. Because Herman and I will fly down there. And all you've got to do is get to the governor and start extradition proceedings. It's as good as done. Well, boys, what are we waiting for? Several hours later, Detectives Borderman and Foy approach a modest home in Portland. Mr. 
Mr. Edmund Romaine? Yes. We're from the Seattle Police Department. Oh, is that so? Yeah, your brother got into a little trouble in Bellingham. Oh, that, yes, yes. <laughs> of course, I, I know about it. Uh, won't you come in? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, uh, won't you gentlemen uh, sit down? I hope you'll excuse my lack of means to entertain such illustrious visitors. Now, don't mind us. We're just cops. Well, then you'll overlook my lack of hospitality. Sure, we've been in lots worse dumps than this. Oh, thank you, gentlemen. Look, Mr. Romine, let's save time by cutting out the horseplay. I don't understand. You will. For the past two or three years, we've been looking for a man we've nicknamed the Phantom Forger. Hmm. We know that you're the guy. Uh, I, uh... I think that you must be mistaken. I know that my brother has been arrested for passing checks, but uh, that has no connection with me. Uh, how did you know it was check trouble, Mr. Romine? Oh, but gentlemen, you told me when you first arrived. I said he was in trouble. I didn't say what kind of trouble. Uh, that's right, you didn't. Uh, but it still doesn't prove anything. No, but this does. I'll lay my cards on the table. We've read the letters you sent to your brother. We have hundreds of witnesses that you hung paper on. And a few of them are sure to identify you. And last, but most important, we have your handwriting with an outstanding hook on the capital letter R. And you know how much paper you've signed with a capital R. If you don't mind my saying so, you gentlemen seem very desperate to put the finger on someone. Anxious, Mr. Romine. Not desperate. Then perhaps uh, you'd like to search my humble dwelling for something of a, an incriminating nature? Uh-huh. Huh? He wouldn't throw that in our face unless he'd gotten rid of his printing press. How'd you get word from your brother? You knew we'd be here and you cleaned the place out. I don't know what you're talking about. All right, well, I'll have a telegraphic warrant here for you in a few minutes. And I'm getting extradition papers from the governor. Will you fight them or are you willing to come to Seattle with us and see if the people you hung paper on can identify you? Well, it looks like Jimmy the Flea is bungled again, doesn't it? Jimmy the Flea? Oh, yeah, that's me. I thought I'd perfected my technique, but, well, there's no use trying to bluff it up. My fingerprints would give me away. I'm the man you're looking for. I'll go back with you. In just a moment, we shall hear the concluding facts regarding our program. If you're like most folks, you find enjoyment in sharing with others the better things of life. All-purpose Rio Grande Cracked is one of those better things. So inasmuch as you are finding a new pleasure and less expense in motoring with this strikingly different gasoline, tell your friends about it. One tankful of all-purpose Rio Grande Cracked, and they'll be asking your opinion on everything. Romine went into Superior Court in Seattle and received a sentence of 20 years in Walla Walla Penitentiary. In Bellingham, the rest of the gang received like sentences. All are learning to their sorrow that crime cannot pay. Seattle Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. A cancellation of broadcast 293 regarding a suspicious man. Suspects this case are now in custody. That's all. Rolling in prison. narrator, Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night for Rio Grande. Next week at this time, Rio Grande will present The Case of the Squealing Rat.